uh, hopefully we're all in the right place. I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, the basics of IoT development, uh, just some uh, all the way from the beginning, prototyping phase, all the way out to production. Uh, that's obviously a very broad topic. Uh, so this talk will end up uh, being a, a very high-level survey of a lot of things you need to think about as you're looking to move into the IoT development space. Um, given the uh, uh, target of this conference, uh, if you have been doing IoT devices for many years, you probably won't get a whole lot out of this talk. I appreciate you coming anyway. Uh, but uh, for those that are new to the space, uh, hopefully this talk will give you uh, a, a good overview uh, and some uh, things to consider uh, as you start uh, thinking about how you're going to design your systems moving forward. So just a, a, a brief overview of what, what we're talking about. Uh, we'll start just talking about what IoT is and what are some of the markets that it's targeting. Uh, most of us, I'm sure that'll be uh, refresher information for, uh, but uh, it, it's always good to start with a little bit of motivation uh, for why we're, we're, we're talking about the things we are. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about the hardware uh, and software uh, things that we would want to look at uh, when you're designing an IoT system. Uh, and finally, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of go to a little bit higher level uh, and talk about some of the, the overall uh, system design considerations uh, in the IoT space. So uh, a bit about me, uh, I've been in the embedded Linux space uh, for about 10 years now, uh, primarily focused on Yocto. Uh, longer than that, I've been in the general embedded space. Uh, in my current role uh, is primarily as a project lead and a solutions architect. Uh, I'm not deeply involved writing the code on a day-to-day -day basis, but I am a technical customer-facing engineer uh, on the Mender.io project, uh, which is a over-the-air update uh, client and server for embedded Linux devices. We got a booth out there, so if you uh, are in the IoT space and have a need for updates, which we will certainly uh, cover here in a little bit, uh, feel free to swing by and we can give you some more details about, uh, uh, about what we have. So let's start with a definition of IoT. Uh, when I was putting these slides together, uh, first thing I did was what everybody does and go to Google and type in IoT, and I got a, got a, few, uh, a few choice links here. Business Insider claims it's a network of interconnected objects able to collect and exchange data using embedded sensors. So a lot of words there. Uh, then I found this other one uh, on the IEEE, which was a lot more content. It was 86 pages. I read about the first paragraph and a half and stopped. Uh, so you're, the, the, the link is down at the bottom. Feel free if you uh, are looking for, uh, if you're having trouble sleeping or whatever, download that and uh, you should be in good shape. After that, I went to the font of all knowledge uh, today. I went to Wikipedia. And uh, Wikipedia has a very similar definition, a network of physical devices, vehicles, home appliances, and other items embedded with electronics, software, sensors, actuators, and connectivity, which enables these objects to connect and exchange data. Again, lots of words, uh, but it comes down to a couple, couple key characteristics. Uh, in the inter Internet of Things space, we're always talking connected devices. It might not be always on connection, but there is some kind of connectivity to these devices. Generally speaking, you have some number of sensors uh, that are able to detect uh, characteristics of their, their environment. You have uh, some number of actuators that are enable, uh, able to affect change in the environment. Um, and in a lot of cases, it, it, you have uh, cloud infrastructure involved. That's not strictly speaking required. There are plenty of uh, IoT applications where there's no co connectivity back to the cloud. But uh, more and more these days, uh, things are moving back to the cloud. So what are some of the typical uh, IoT applications? First ones that come to mind are, are the, consumer, uh, the consumer devices, obviously the, the Nest thermostat and the, the competitors there for the uh, smart home uh, climate control systems. Smart lighting, I've got a few uh, different things, one from Ikea and one some random that I picked up on sale on Amazon one day to, to control lights in my house. Uh, home security, there's a, a lot of those. I know the, the Ring doorbell is a ver fairly common uh, device out that's uh, advertising quite a bit now, and there's other, uh, there's other connected uh, alarms and, and that kind of thing. And uh, connected automobiles, uh, obviously a very big space. I know there's a lot of people here uh, in the automotive space, and uh, automobiles are getting more and more connected every day. I saw a stat somewhere that the, a, uh, a modern high-end uh, automobile has about 10 times the number of lines of code in it as the, the 747 uh, jet. So think about that next time you're getting into one of these vehicles. There's a lot of code in there, uh, and there's a lot of connectivity going on. 
Other markets for Internet of Things, industrial, uh, industrial applications in the uh, operations center, a lot of factory uh, inventory management. Um, it makes it a lot easier to, to deploy a large fleet of fairly low power devices to track things that uh, previously would require fairly high uh, compute capabilities. So a lot, a lot of uh, factories are, are re retooling and adding new uh, capabilities uh, to track things at a much gran more granular level through the factory processes. Seeing some in enterprise, uh, supply chain management is obviously a big deal. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen uh, headlines of uh, issues with supply chain management and when, I, when can I get the next greatest phone and you know, when are they gonna have enough uh, LCD panels or whatever. Uh, so being able to, to track the, the, the supply chain as the, the parts you need go from one, uh, one place to the next and make it all the way uh, to, to your, uh, uh, to your uh, manufactured device uh, is, is pretty important. Medical, uh, me obviously there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of things going on in the medical space. Um, and then business operations, uh, I've, I, I've read somewhere about an ele elevator company that's using uh, IoT-enabled services uh, to help improve reliability, to decrease downtime, decrease the time that people are stuck in elevators when there are uh, inevitable issues. Uh, but the ultimate goal for all of these, especially once you get outside of the consumer space, is obviously re uh, lowering your operating costs moving forward. And finally, one area that uh, I, I, some places are doing better than others is, is in the municipal space. Obviously, traffic control, public transit, there's a lot of, lot of possibilities there, especially with the connected automobiles. I know uh, I'm from the Tampa, Florida area, and I know they've got a project going now. Uh, somehow, using connected automobiles and then sensors on the streets to help control traffic flow and do extra studies and things like that. So there's a lot of, lot of interesting applications. As I mentioned, cloud infrastructure uh, is uh, increasingly important in the Internet of Things. You see all the logos on this slide. Uh, there's, uh, there, there's no end of uh, uh, providers for cloud infrastructure. Uh, at, at a minimum, they're used for device control and, and uh, data store in your, in, in your Internet of Things applications. Uh, depending on exactly what your uh, workflow and use cases are, the cloud infrastructure may provide AI and big data services uh, in addition to just simple data aggregation. Um, and some of them also have uh, overall fleet management uh, device uh, dashboards and that kind of thing where your operations team can actually see at a glance a, a view of your entire device fleet, be able to, be able to make changes, trigger updates, uh, turn devices on and off, that kind of thing. So this is a, a diagram I put together to kind of help uh, explain what IoT is, because there's a lot of buzzwords in there. Uh, you see at the upper, upper half of the screen is the world of atoms. That's the, the, the world of real things. Uh, and then we have our, our lovely little uh, uh, border there, which, which is uh, called the edge. And on the, on the inside of the edge is the world of bits. And that's, uh, you know, the, the IoT kind of spans that boundary. Uh, you have a number of devices. Uh, the devices in green here, uh, one of the architectures is the devices themselves uh, on the edge will connect directly to the cloud. So the device, uh, and that's uh, a lot of the devices that uh, folks at this conference deal with, they're running a full embedded Linux system. They have all the connectivity they need. They're able to connect directly to the cloud and uh, they can do whatever they need uh, on, on the device themselves. Some of the low power devices, thing, things running, uh, some of the smaller RTOSs, that kind of thing might use, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Come on, there we go. Some of the, the other devices might use uh, a, a gateway between the device. Uh, so some of, these device, some of these devices will be running a small uh, real-time operating system uh, with uh, limited connectivity, limited communications capabilities. So then they would pass the data back to a gateway, which has uh, more, more capabilities to actually deliver that data back into the cloud infrastructure. Uh, and and the, the, the third typical architecture we see is that uh, the gateway is sometimes optional even for some of these smaller devices. They can communicate between themselves directly. Uh, there may not be actually any cloud uh, connectivity needed for a particular use case. So in that case, uh, if your devices can communicate directly to each other uh, and share whatever data is necessary, you can get away without even having the gateway in that, in that instance. So talking about some of the connectivity options that you'll need to consider when you are planning your design, uh, the, the first couple on this list I think uh, most of us are familiar with. Uh, we've got the short distance, generally considered personal area, 
Uh, NFC and Bluetooth, although I've seen claims that Bluetooth can go up to 30 meters, I don't think I've ever managed to get my Bluetooth headset to go more than about six or eight feet uh, before I start getting dropouts. So depending on the amount of data you're transferring, obviously you're gonna get uh, better or worse uh, distance on, on some of these things. Moving up into medium distance connectivity, uh, venerable Wi-Fi and Ethernet, uh, I think we all understand what that is and the, the pluses and minuses of those. Those are obviously fairly high bandwidth, uh, but especially if you're dealing with Wi-Fi, uh, you've got some extra configuration uh, that needs to be tracked and that kind of thing. Moving on from there, uh, these are some of the emerging technologies uh, that are increasingly in use in the Internet of Things space. These are typically longer distance than within the buildings. Uh, city scale is, is what they're looking at here. Uh, you've got LoRa and LoRaWAN, uh, which are protocols that are governed by an industry alliance, and there are a, a number of cities that are rolling out uh, the, these kind of networks. Uh, and then Sigfox is a commercial entity doing a very similar thing. So if you've got a, a, a fleet of, say, weather sensors you want to deploy across the city, um, the, the devices uh, can, can communicate over some of these protocols and not have to have any kind of gateways or anything. Uh, and uh, the big advantage is, of course, the battery life on these things is measured in years. They're very low power. They're not really intended for high bandwidth applications. You're not going to be streaming uh, multimedia data over these protocols, but uh, that's not really what they're designed for. Uh, and then moving out from there, looking at even uh, larger scales, uh, nationwide, statewide, uh, th then you start looking at things like cellular and LTE with uh, the obvious costs associated with that. So when you're talking connectivity, uh, some of the, you know, you've got to figure out what, what your bandwidth needs are, uh, what your latencies and that kind of thing are, as well as what the costs are going to be. Obviously, with Wi-Fi and Ethernet, uh, typically that's not going to be a metered connection, but uh, obviously when you get into cellular and LTE, uh, you're generally going to be paying per bit in that, in that kind of uh, uh, scenario. So moving up the stack a bit, uh, we have the uh, higher level IoT communication protocols. And, and, these, th and there's definitely some uh, overlap between things here, uh, but these are the kind of things uh, that are typically layered on top of the base connectivity that we discussed in the previous slide. Um, so HTTP uh, and uh, secure HTTP, REST APIs, that's a pretty common mechanism uh, that, that, that's used today. Uh, but there are some other things uh, in the IoT space that you will start to see as you, as you uh, uh, ramp up in your research tasks. Uh, six low pan is an implementation of IPv6 over some of the low, the, the low power WAN protocols. It's not one I have any direct experience with, but I know it does come up from time to time. Um, MQTT is a, it's a more structured protocol than say something like a REST API where, where you get to define everything. MQTT really follows a publish subscribe model. Uh, it's very lightweight. Um, most implementations typically are gonna run, run across your, uh, your, your standard TCP uh, ethernet links. Um, and there was uh, sometime recently a, an actual standard published for that. So that's getting to be extremely common in the IoT space. Uh, and it's very easy to use. There's libraries for just about any language you may want. Uh, and, and it's very easy to get started with that. Uh, then the, there's another one called Zero MQ. Uh, it's similar in its, you know, it does have the publish subscribe model, but it supports a few other, uh, a few other models. There's more push pull and router dealer kinds of things that are implemented in there. Uh, and it is an open source protocol, uh, so that makes it very uh, applicable for most of the, the, the Linux based IoT designs. Um, and then, then you'll start to see things like Zigbee, uh, which is primarily used for home automation. I think that's a little bit lower level protocol than something like MQTT, but it's uh, definitely uh, growing in popularity. Um, and then one that, that I have had uh, conversations with folks about, which is kind of uh, a, a, a bit of a, a stretch to have on this slide, but it's the DDS, uh, which is a data distribution service. This provides uh, for a global data space distributed with uh, proper access control. So if you have a fairly large amount of data that you want to have distributed and have uh, proper backups and that kind of thing, uh, this is certainly something uh, to, to consider uh, moving forward. So, hardware. First thing typically in the design is you're gonna start thinking about hardware. Uh, first choice is, uh, you know, do you have an MCU versus a system on chip? Uh, MCUs are generally lower powered systems, not gonna be running Linux, uh, probably will be running an RTOS of some kind. Uh, I think uh, probably for this audience, we're probably mostly looking towards the, the SOC level, but I know there's uh, quite a few folks here uh, doing things like Zephyr and other real-time operating systems that, that are more appropriate for the uh, MCU uh, level chips. 
from, from there, you, you know, once you've decided on the, the basic chipset that's part of your system, then you start looking at onboard peripherals. What uh, hardware does your particular use case require? Uh, most of these chips are going to have a variety of onboard peripherals. Uh, and if you're buying things you don't need, obviously you're paying extra money. Uh, but if you buy something that doesn't have, uh, have what you need on it, uh, you know, that's not good either. So uh, that's, the, that's the next basic step in de deciding on uh, the chip is mapping out what your use cases are and what uh, peripherals you may need. Um, then start to look at the hobbyist versus the commercial vendor type platforms. Uh, Raspberry Pi and BeagleBone, uh, we use those a lot in our day to day. Um, but uh, typically, lead times and inventories can be can be tricky if you're going to be uh, producing builds in you know tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of devices. Uh, you may be better off going with a commercial vendor that, that's able to actually satisfy the, uh, those numbers. Um, uh, other things to consider: uh, Are you going to have battery power? Or is it going to be hardwired power? Uh, because some some chips uh, are going to be running obviously lower power than others, uh, so that that's something to consider. And obviously, price always comes in. Uh, and the last one that I'll mention here is the form factor. Uh, boards like the BeagleBone and the Raspberry Pi are typically standalone boards. They'll be mounted in a case somewhere, uh, but the, the, the boards themselves are, are fully functional uh, without any add-ons. Uh, then another common uh, design that, that we see a lot is the system on module, where you have a baseboard, uh, which is typically provided as a reference design by the manufacturer. And then they also provide the system on module uh, where you, for your design, you would take the system on module unmodified, but you would create a custom version of that baseboard that would have the exact peripherals you need on it. Uh, the, nice, the nice point about th these kind of designs is you can customize uh, in the baseboard. The connectivity between the SOM and the baseboard is well defined uh, so that you know that uh, if your board works with their baseboard, that as long as you use the same protocol uh, and have the same pinout, you're, you'll be able to plug that into your custom design. And it also gives you the flexibility. Most of these vendors uh, have a wide range of system on modules that are available uh, with different MCUs or different SOCs on them. So if you start with uh, a lower powered chip and at some point you decide you, you need to move to a higher powered system, you have the ability to simply swap in a new SOM. And it should, in that case, uh, work pretty well with your existing designs without having to retool your designs. So once we picked. Uh, Hardware, now we start, need to start thinking about the system software that, that we're going to be running on these devices. Three main choices, typically, uh, are, an o, are a full-blown full OS, uh, which I think is probably the choice of most of the people in this room, versus an RTOS, uh, versus just simply writing bare metal code uh, directly, uh, you know, write every line of code in the system, do it a bare metal control loop. Um, then once you've chosen there, obviously, if you're in the, in the Linux space, you have a choice for system development tools, things like Yakko and BuildRoot, which are very, very common. And, and there's a lot of uh, expertise here, a lot of, lot, of, lot of folks talking about those kind of things. Uh, then OpenWRT is, a, is another option. Uh, and finally, you have things like Debian and, and other uh, desktop class OSs that have been repurposed in the embedded space. Um, and then from there, you also have some additional deployment strategies, um, hypervisors uh, and containers. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of talk of that, a uh, lot of activity in the industry today uh, with a lot of asynchronous multiprocessor designs where you're running maybe a hypervisor and you're running an RTOS on one core and a, a full-blown Linux instance on the remaining of the cores um, and, and things like that. So there's a, you know, some very high level decisions that need to be made about your system software uh, deployment strategies. Uh, and finally, depending on the industry you're in, uh, security and safety uh, are a, a, a big concern. ISO 26262, it's a automotive, automobile functional safety spec. Uh, it's pretty hard to, to satisfy something like that in Linux, but uh, a lot of the RTOSs will have that. So that's where the uh, AMP type uh, design will come in if you have some areas of your code that need that level of certification, you can implement those in an RTOS on, on a sequestered core and then have your Linux system handling the, the, the rest of the connectivity uh, on the other, other, other cores of your uh, multi-core chipset. Uh, and then obviously things like SE Linux, at, uh, App Armor, and uh, Smack are our Linux side uh, uh, security frameworks that, that, that can add additional security over uh, the, the traditional split model of uh, users and then root who, has, who can do anything and everything. 
So moving up the stack a bit more, now we start talking about uh, application software. And uh, this is uh, definitely outside of my area of expertise. So most of these things are just names to me. Uh, but uh, application frameworks that we see commonly, uh, things like Node-RED, Node.js, those are very common in the uh, IoT space. Uh, Eclipse Cura is, uh, I believe it's more of a, a development uh, IDE type plugin that, that, that uh, it works on the development side. Uh, and then Qt, obviously, a lot of the graphical uh, embedded Linux applications are running Qt-based APIs. Um, and then from there, uh, you know, how are you going to develop your code? You're going to use uh, Eclipse or some kind of CLI, or, or you know, what is your, what are, what are your developers going to be looking at on a day to day? Typically, if you're in a uh, commercial RTOS or even a, uh, a, an open source RTOS, they're going to have one me mechanism for working. If you're in uh, the Linux space, obviously, it's going to be very dependent on uh, the build system that you use, the packaging system that you, you use, and that kind of thing. Language availability, something to consider. If you're in the Linux space, that's usually not a big deal. Uh, Golang is obviously uh, increasing in popularity. I see a lot of people talking about Rust these days, although I don't think we've seen it a whole lot uh, just yet in terms of uh, actual devices going to market. Uh, and then finally, uh, just look at third-party package availability. You know what your use cases are. You know if you need uh, specific libraries or specific protocols. Uh, a lot of that is going to help drive uh, some of the other decisions that you might make based on where the, the libraries you need are available. If they're in the Yocto project, great, that's an option. If not, uh, if they're provided as uh, you know, packages for Debian, uh, that may push you towards a, a Debian-based system. And, 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 uh, and likewise, for other packages and, and uh, protocols, calls you may need. So just briefly, uh, mentioning a few things uh, if you aren't running Linux. Co a couple options I mentioned, the bare metal embedded control loop, uh, very low level, uh, writing everything yourself. Uh, and then one step up from that is an embedded RTOS, uh, things like uh, Zephyr and Minute, uh, include OS, uh, free RTOS, those are all uh, things that, that we hear in discussions with the uh, IoT developers that, that, that they're considering. And then there's commercial offerings, uh, such as Nucleus VxWorks and QNX. Uh, obviously, the cost models are going to differ very between them. Sometimes there will be royalties, sometimes there won't. Uh, sometimes there will be a development upfront license. Uh, so, so that all has to, to be taken into consideration uh, as you're planning your system. Uh, and I did want to mention Windows IoT Core here. I wasn't really sure the best way to classify it other than as a desktop class OS. Uh, in the area I live, there's a, a lot of uh, Windows IoT development going on, so I've actually been to several meetups with folks that, that, that use it, and they, they really like it. Uh, I don't know enough about it to, to really comment, but it, it is an option. Moving on, if we th assume that we are uh, working on a, a Linux system, uh, I briefly mentioned some of these, but you have quite a few options here. Uh, you have your de desktop class distributions, Debian, Ubuntu, things like that. Uh, a couple options with those. You can go with a direct install. Typically, uh, most of them are available just in a disk image that you download. You DD out to your SD card or your EMMC, and you boot. And typically, there will be a package manager, apt-get, yum, something like that. You install everything you need, uh, all your dependencies, and then you can uh, either package your application as uh, in that package manager format or how, you know, whatever you decide is appropriate to get the code onto the device. Uh, another option for the desktop class distributions is uh, packaging strips. I know that in the, in the Debian space, uh, there, there's uh, DE Bootstrap and, and other options that, that uh, actually allow you to kind of script and, and customize uh, these systems offline. Uh, and then the output, of, co of course, is, is typically the uh, image that then gets written to your, your storage media. Um, one, one step down from there is the embedded distribution builders, things like Yocto, Buildroot, and OpenWRT, which uh, I mentioned previously. I've got, uh, we'll go into a little bit of what those are uh, in, in just a moment. And finally, there's uh, some hybrids, uh, which uh, are, are new to me. Uh, I know there's folks here that are giving talks about them. So things like ESAR, which is uh, an ELBE, which I believe are basically just uh, using BitBake uh, with uh, special customized recipes to actually pull binaries from the Debian uh, build system. So you're actually not doing a full build every time of each package like you do with a typical Yocto BitBake build, uh, but uh, you're actually still able to control it and, and set up your designs and your configuration uh, in a language uh, configuration language that you may already be familiar with. So Yocto project, uh, for those that aren't uh, familiar with it, 
The quote at the top of the slide comes directly from the, the, the Yocto Project website. Um, the, the, the primary focus of Yocto is uh, the recipes that tell the system how to build all the packages that are part of your system, how to build the images and that kind of thing. The primary output of a Yocto project build is a package feed, which is really just a directory somewhere in your build tree with a, a, a whole lot of dot, uh, .rpm files or dot, uh, .deb files or whatever packaging format you choose. The secondary output uh, is the boot images, and this is the actual uh, bag of bits that gets installed uh, on your storage media, uh, and it contains typically the entire root file system, bootloaders, and that kind of thing. Uh, Yocto generally builds all components from source, although there are some things like the, the Linux firmware that are, are typically just uh, binary blobs that are installed. Uh, and the Yocto focuses on mechanism, not policy. The, and that kind of goes back to the, the, the quote about it's not a distribution, it builds a custom one for you. There are sensible defaults for most things in Yocto so that you can get up and running really quickly. However, Yocto f is focused on allowing you to make changes to things like the init system. So you can switch easily between sysv init and systemd and things like that. So uh, the, 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 the focus of the Yocto team is not to enforce policy on you as the system designer. So you're able to, to customize it however you want. Moving on to BuildRoot. Uh, BuildRoot has a similar objective to Yocto. Uh, it, its focus is on, being, is on a, a much simpler view, and they build simpler systems by default uh, than the Yocto project does. Uh, they don't support package feeds in, in the same way that uh, Yocto does. The primary output of BuildRoot are the images that are installed on your, your system. So it's the root file system, the kernel, the bootloader, and that kind of thing. Uh, it does, again, focus, uh, it does build everything from source and it, its default is to focus on simplicity. So if you download the build root sources and you build without making any modifications, you're going to get a very bare bones system that is enough to come up to a shell prompt and uh, connect to a wired ethernet. And then you need to start adding things back in, turning on package configurations for the, the, all the packages that are installed and that kind of thing. And finally, just want to mention OpenWRT. Uh, it's a, uh, a fully writable system with package management. So it's very similar in concept to things like Debian and Ubuntu. Uh, its primary focus is networking. Uh, obviously, based on the name, it came out, uh, it originally started as a replacement firmware for the Linksys WRT uh, uh, family of, uh, uh, of home routers. Uh, it's since been expanded to support uh, just about every, uh, every commercial router uh, uh, available. If you look at their support page, it's pretty impressive how many, uh, how many devices are supported. Uh, it does, uh, it's primarily a, a binary distri distribution. There's more of a separation in the OpenWRT world between the, the bits that you run and then the build system uh, than, than is, uh, for example, with Yocto and BuildRoot. So most users of the OpenWRT uh, won't be messing with the OpenWRT build system. You'll just download the pre-built binary for your, your particular router, install it, and you're good to go. Um, and, there are, and they do provide uh, network available package repositories for, for, for OpenWRT, unlike uh, Yocto and BuildRoot, uh, where, especially with Yocto, the package feed is part of the build that you do, which you can then make available on the network, but there are no generally available package repositories for those, whereas with OpenWRT, when you install and boot up, you can actually go to the package manager and install new packages on your, on your device at runtime. So looking up at, at a little bit higher level uh, considerations for when you're deploying an IoT device fleet, uh, things you might need to think about. What are the lifetimes of your devices? Typically consumer devices, you know, the lifetimes are anywhere from six months to you know, two to three years, although I think the router I'm, I have at home now is uh, you know, four to five years, but uh, it's getting long in the tooth, so I'm getting ready to replace that. If you're in the automotive space, uh, you know, you're talking at least a 10-year lifetime once the, the systems are deployed, and typically the lead times for, for uh, new designs in the automotive space is, you know, between five and 10 years. So right away, you're, you're looking at 15 to 20 years total, total lifetime from uh, prototype to production on the automotive space. So that's definitely something you need to keep in mind. Um, what kind of fleet do you have? Are your devices, are your devices managed by, the, by you as the system designer or uh, by some central authority, or are they unmanaged? 
Uh, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're selling consumer devices that are going into people's homes, you're probably not going to have a managed fleet. Uh, so these devices will be out there. They'll be, uh, they'll, they'll be out there on their own. They need to, to do their updates and that kind of thing. But if you have a, a, a device, uh, a smaller uh, deployment or a managed fleet, you probably uh, will be able to, to, to have visibility into what the devices are doing over their lifetime. Um, what, what's the, the operating environment? How hostile is it? If it's uh, deployed in... Uh, say coffee shops uh, with you know open Wi-Fi, you know you're going to be uh, getting uh, network pings on a fairly regular basis. If it's uh, in a fairly controlled lab environment, uh, then then obviously that's a that that's a different uh, different uh, consideration. What's the power and connectivity like? Obviously, uh, if you are battery based, that's always a concern. You need to make sure that you can handle uh, unexpected power outage outages. Uh, can, can the users modify the software? Do you have a system with uh, installable packages where the end users of the device are actually able to manipulate the software that's installed on the device? That adds a whole level of uh, security and complexity that uh, if you can get away with a completely read-only system that you don't have to deal with. And then, uh, you know, what, what is the end user interface? Is this a, a, uh, a, an appliance that goes in a, in a cabinet somewhere and nobody ever looks at it? Uh, in that case, you can get away with doing updates uh, you know, when, when your software determines it's right. But if it's something with an end user interface, generally, you, you don't want to install new software or do reboots or anything without uh, prompting the end user. Uh, and then, uh, as we mentioned before, the bandwidth uh, is always uh, something to consider, uh, both the network bandwidth to your device as well as uh, how much cloud compute uh, capabilities you might need for, for that cloud structure uh, and the back end. So, and, and security, we'll talk a, a, a bit about this. Uh, the quote at the top, the SNIOT stands for security. I hear it a lot. Don't know exactly who, who, who came up with it, uh, but uh, the, the, the Twitter handle you see there is the, the, the best guess I could find uh, after searching for a bit. Uh, but uh, I think it's obvious that uh, all security, all, all software has bugs. Not all bugs are, uh, become vulnerabilities, but uh, when you have uh, 1 to 25 bugs for every 1,000 lines of code, there's li liable to be some uh, vulnerabilities out there that will eventually uh, allow your device to, to, to be taken over. Um, so just in general, uh, just as general advice, use well-maintained software, keep it updated. You don't want to be the only one using uh, you know, some branch of uh, U-Boot or a Linux kernel that uh, hasn't been touched in, in a number of years. Uh, and then, you know, just follow general security practices, principle of least privilege. Don't run something as root unless it needs to be root. If you do have something like SE Linux or Smack, you can get a little bit more fine-grained control over that. Uh, Kirchhoff's principle uh, basically uh, says that, uh, you know, the, the only... Uh, security of an encryption system is the key. So don't don't rely on security through obscurity. Use a well-known encryption system if you are when you are doing uh, crypto uh, in your devices. And just as kind of a self-serving uh, uh, thing here at the end, over-the-air updates are a must-have these days, especially for any of these devices that are connected. As I said, you're going to have vulner bugs, which will eventually become vulnerabilities. And if your device is connected, uh, there are people out there scanning, uh, and, and they will take over your device pretty quickly. And uh, I'll just leave this slide up. Uh, it, this is, uh, I think, fairly well understood. It kind of just... Uh, goes to the point on my previous slide about uh, the, the number of bugs out there. But uh, with the average re remediation time being 110 days, uh, well beyond when the, there's a 90% probability of a, a, a vulnerability being exploited, obviously, uh, we as an industry have to, to get better at uh, getting these things fixed and get, uh, getting the, the fixes deployed to our devices. So briefly about patching and updates, uh, you see the, the, the number from ABI research there. One third of uh, current recalls are for problems that could have been fixed over the air. Uh, $35 billion in savings in 2022, according to one automotive survey. Obviously in the automotive space, uh, it, if uh, there are vulnerabilities that you can fix over the air, that's significantly cheaper than uh, spinning up all your repair centers, having your uh, uh, customers bring the devices in uh, and have them uh, flashed over USB. So uh, if at all possible, 
definitely when you're deploying IoT devices or any kind of connected device, uh, over-the-air updates should be considered a must-have, especially given some of the lifetimes uh, and uh, the, ex the, the expense of accessing these devices when they're deployed in the field. Uh, all, all of these things uh, put together to tell, tell us we need to do this. And, and it, when you're looking at updates, uh, just a, some, some high-level design criteria, robustness. How, how, do, how does the update mechanism ensure that you don't get brick devices in the field? Uh, if, you, you know, if the device is on the, on the shelf next to you, it's easy enough to reach up and, and hit the power, power switch. Uh, but I was uh, talking to somebody yesterday who does uh, devices for undersea usage. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive to, to charter a boat, get a dive team, go out, uh, send the dive team down 200, 300 feet, and uh, hit the power supply. So uh, you don't want to uh, be deploying an update, have the, the power cycle at that exact moment, and end up with a, a device with a corrupted root file system. So uh, you know, the, the robustness of the, of the update uh, system is, is critical. Uh, security, uh, obviously, TLS, image signing, all I industry best practices, uh, I think that's all fairly standard. Uh, are, the atom are the updates atomic? If you're doing apt-get update, uh, typically that's not an atomic type of update. Uh, it makes it very difficult to know exactly what set of software is on any given device. Uh, if you're doing full image updates, it makes it very easy to say, my fleet of devices is all running the, the exact same uh, bit of software. Uh, and the automatic rollback, that goes to implementing uh, the robustness. Uh, so if there is an issue with, with an update, is your system going to detect it and automatically roll back to an own good configuration? Uh, and finally, you know, how, how expandable is, it is, is the update system for your particular uh, workflow and use case? Uh, the, the update system isn't going to know about your database uh, structure or what peripherals you have. And, and so there needs to be mechanisms in the, update cap in the update system for you as the system designer to be able to, to, to customize it and say, OK, on a new boot, I want to test the, I want to uh, validate the database, and I want to uh, check this peripheral over here and make sure everything's working. So the expandability uh, is something to consider when you, when you are adding this uh, into your system. And with that, I think we've got just a few minutes for questions. I got a couple links here uh, that, that, uh, that go into a bit more depth on some of these things. Uh, if you, I would encourage you to check them out. Uh, there's a couple articles and, uh, and a talk I gave last time that goes into a, a bit more depth about uh, things like Acto and BuildRoot. So if you have an interest in that, uh, feel free to take a look. And with that, I'll open the floor for questions. We've got mics on either side, so if you have a question, just come on up and uh, 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 make sure that everybody can hear you and we get it recorded. All right, I must be uh, in between lunch. Oh, we got one. I, uh, evidently not. Such as what? I'm sorry. So the Linux Enterprise okay. Less. Okay. Yeah. So the the the, the yeah. The, so the comment was, and, and and you're right. I didn't mention it. Uh, you know, I mentioned Debian. I mentioned Yakto and BuildRoot. There are a number of commercially uh, supported uh, 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 desktop class distros, such as uh, SUSE Linux, uh, that are supported and, and available for embedded slash IoT use. So uh, that's another certainly another consideration when you're looking at your system software strategy. Is you know who who do you call when something goes wrong? Uh, if you're if you're starting with a completely open source thing, uh, it's uh, you know you might get help on a mailing list, you might not. But if you've got a device, you know a fleet of 100,000 devices in the field, you might want to consider some kind of support arrangement uh, so you get somebody to call. All right, let's see if this side's working. Evidently not. Nope. <laughs> I have a question about your product, Mender I.O. Uh -huh. Does it allow to enforce an atomic update of systems that consist of several Linux nodes? Um, no, not today, it does not. 
Uh, we, uh, our product is focused on a single node. Uh, there, you know, when you're talking about multiple node systems, uh, you definitely need some kind of higher orchestration lo layer that can handle that. Uh, we've talked about ways to do that. Um, and, and, and certainly uh, some of the expandability and plugins that we have can certainly p can be used to implement something like that, but that would require uh, custom development uh, based on what we have today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much.